Um, <coughs> This is a title, uh, late last night I changed it from what it is in your, in your books because I wanted to stress the changes in the intercrop system over a period of time as opposed to how we normally do it, which is to compare intercrop systems to conventional monocrop systems. I think as agroforesters we all know that if we add a third dimension uh, into our system we're in all likelihood probably going to enhance uh, habitat. So Hanita Koblenz, uh, Anita Koblenz was the undergraduate student who performed the bird survey in uh, 1995, and Sophie Gibbs was the one who performed the uh, uh, bird survey in 2014 as part of her uh, MES. So my study is uh, going to take the normal uh, presentation outline with one important disclaimer here, and uh, that is as this is. Uh, that guy there is my dad. Al Gordon, and he was known in his neighborhood for raising wolves and foxes and, and raccoons and also raptors, and he was very, uh, very good at it. And uh, he's also a very good photographer, and 10 years later, when he was uh, 20 years old, he won first prize, grand prize at the Chicago uh, National Photographic Exposition for this photograph of young great horned owls. And until dementia set in a couple of years ago, he could identify more than 200 birds by sound by sound and a lot more. So the disclaimer is this, that ornithology gene did not <laughs> transfer over. I am not an ornithologist or an avian expert or even a birder. In fact, to this day, I have a difficult time telling a robin from a, from a seagull. And in fact, the gene could not be transplanted despite his best efforts over the first 18 years of, of my, my lifetime. So that's where we're, we're going from. So, as I said initially, if we add a third dimension into our agroecosystem, in all likelihood we're going to enhance habitat, and that's exactly what our study um, showed here. So I could actually present two slides to you and then sit down and my talk would be over. But I thought it might be interesting to um, take a broader picture at how agroforestry uh, might actually address a very important problem. So before I came here, I went and vi visited uh, Bridget Stuchberry down the road at York University. Uh, she's been working on songbirds for about 35 years now, and she's written many papers, a couple of books, including this one, Silence of the Songbirds, How We Are Losing the World's Songbirds and What We Can uh, Do to Save Them. So I had some discussions with her, told her what I was going to do, and she very kindly loaned me about 15 slides, which I think you'll find uh, very interesting. So we took a look at the big picture, and then we'll sort of narrow down to uh, the study that, um, that my students undertook. So she's interested in songbirds, like this scarlet tanager. So they're the ones that do the nice warbly sounds and have the musical uh, notes and all that kind of stuff. And uh, she has identified over the course of her work that there are a vast number of songbirds that are in decline, including some of these that you know, Dick Kissel, Eastern Kingbird, Sicilian Warbler, et cetera, et cetera. And actually, uh, she has some very good data, the benefits of long-term research. Going back to 1965, uh, when she gave me these slides, she had an ornithological index on it, which we don't have to worry about. All we have to worry about is numbers, basically. So you can see the decline in the wood thrush up at the top and the bobolink, which in southern Ontario is uh, rare and endangered. Early hain is uh, very problematic. And so if you get greedy farmers that are trying to take off three crops of hay, basically, and they take the, the hay off prior to July 1st, they often damage the nest. So on my farm, my Mennonite renters are under strict orders not to take the first cut of hay off until, until July 1st, and that helps a little bit. They are ground nesting, and <coughs> they can often get their, <coughs> their chicks off. So, as you'll uh, probably be aware, birds generally reside in two regions of the planet. During the winter, uh, they take refuge in Mexico, Central America, and South America, and then in uh, the spring and summer, uh, they breed up in the northern part of Canada. This is Wilson's Warbler, so its breeding range is a little farther north, but we have lots of birds that, that breed in southern Ontario, basically. And the problem is a two-edged sword. So in the north, because of our very fragmented uh, southern Ontario landscape and small woodlots, there's not much 
of, of interior forest left. A lot of it is, is edge. And so that, coupled with things like this, the brown-headed cowbird, which is a brood parasite, which puts their egg in amongst, in this case, I believe those are robin eggs. And when they hatch, the, uh, the brown-headed cowbird, the little uh, chick knocks the other ones out. And so as a result of that, and you can see here, this is the head of a chipmunk foraging on uh, eggs. So as a result of these uh, parasitic and uh, uh, enemies, basically, uh, the reproductive success for most of the species that she's been investigating has been in uh, very severe uh, decline. The other end of the scale, uh, the forests that the birds used to visit uh, 50 to 60 years ago uh, in the wintertime have been heavily compromised as a result of tropical deforestation. Uh, on, the, on the right there is uh, Mexico, 67 forested areas in 1990, and sort of what it, what it looks like. So you end up with these very fragmented and destroyed uh, woodlots, and it's just very difficult for the birds to find uh, any chance uh, to survive. So uh, they often lose out. This one is a wood thrush, uh, Mexico. It basically lives in forest edges, and this often will either decrease its uh, ability to survive in the wintertime, or actually it, it may make it so weak that it has a very difficult time migrating back, back up north. <clears throat> Another couple of examples, Jamaica young American red starts, and Mexico young hooded warblers live as desperate floaters because there's not enough forest left. So. <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, prior to 2006, if you were interested in investigating these types of things, you actually had to catch a bird in its um, in its breeding range, band it. It had to fly to South America over winter and fly back, and you had to catch it again and read the band. And all that gave you if the bird actually made it back. If it only made it halfway, you're reliant upon another individual to actually phone the phone number and tell you where the bird is or uh, where they found it. Um, so all that gives you basically is numbers of birds that go down and come back. And then in 2006, this little thing came along and our uh, guide at the Horticultural Research Station was talking about this particular unit as well too. It's a geolocator. It uh, weighs about a one and a half grams. It's mounted on the bird's back. It doesn't have any GPS capacity, although I imagine it won't be too long before that technology will exist. So all it does, it goes on when it's light and off when it's dark. It's just got a simple little switch in it. You still have to capture the bird when it comes back. And when you put the print out, it tells you at exactly what time sunrise started and what time sunset um, uh, uh, came along. And so as the birds uh, fly during the night and rest during the day, all you have to do is take this information, go to your chart of lats and longs for North America, where we know where the sun rises and sun sets, uh, down to a second accuracy, and that will tell you exactly where the bird was. And so this added a tremendous uh, amount of knowledge to her uh, area of, of research. So. Here's a, uh, again, a wood thrush. You can see the little thing mounted on, on her back. And <clears throat> she started out on the 12th of April, uh, came up here by the 18th of 20, rested three days, and got back home, which was somewhere on the Ohio-New York border, by the 25th of, of April. So that's 11, 13 days from Brazil, but only eight actual days of, of flying, which if you think about it, is pretty, pretty amazing. So here's the problem. If you are a bird that is lucky enough to find some interior habitat in your overwintering ground, you're probably going to get enough food and you're going to be able to maintain your body weight. So when you start off, this particular bird uh, overwintered 1st of November to 21st of April, came here 22nd of April, made the big leap of faith across the Gulf of Mexico <laughs> and got up here on the 3rd of May. So if you are not fortunate to find that type of habitat and you are left as a desperate floater, as, as Dr. Stutzberry uh, describes them, uh, then basically you got to the Gulf of Mexico and decided to make a long detour around it. You arrived back on the 26th of May, so almost three weeks after that first bird did. So that first bird has already built a nest and produced eggs, made it, produced eggs, and maybe sitting on them, while you're left basically trying to find some interior habitat which may not actually exist. So you may have to take lesser habitat on the outside of a woodlot where you're going to be subject to some of those predatory pressures that, uh, that I so indicated. I four words, you know. We get migratory birds that stop, lay their first 
through. They get them before they go and, and they hatch, they get them going, and then they leave. Is that because of that? Um, 30 years ago, I didn't see it. I don't know that they may that may actually be. I hearken back to the statement I made about not being an, an ornithologist. The uh, it may very well be that there is. Well, we, have a, we have a four week period and we have hummingbirds, and then they're gone. Right. So there may be. They're, they're in the spring and they're in the fall. There may they're gone. there may be a built-in seasonality to them that says at a certain period of time or, or once they, they've left using the winds to move could be yeah. yeah all of the above okay so um, what did Bridget uh, conclude um, uh, about one of the solutions uh, to this problem well her first and foremost was get rid of cats and get rid of buildings that have lights on at night they kill approximately and this is a broad range because nobody knows for sure somewhere between a hundred million and one billion songbirds every year in North America those two factors cats and and like so what she's suggesting that we move away in the tropical areas from Sun coffee situations which is the majority of it they used to be like this traditional shade uh, coffee systems and develop agroforestry systems <clears throat> that actually would provide suitable habitat for them. There's been an awful lot of work uh, done on this. This came out in actually 2010 from the environmental research where shade grown farms boost biodiversity by providing a haven for migratory birds. But there's not very much information about whether that same implementation of agroforestry practices at northern latitudes uh, would do the same thing. I think it, it probably would. So let's go on to my mundane little study now. Uh, it was, uh, took place at the, because I can't follow that by any stretch of the imagination, took place at the University of Guelph Agroforestry Research Station, which was established in uh, 87. We've got a variety of crops, as Naresh told you about, and a variety of different tree species. And this year, the trees are uh, 30 years of age. That's what it looked like on the first day of planting back in 1987. And she's got her hand on top of a two-year-old black walnut tree. This area here, the leave area, is very important economically for those of you who intercrop because it starts out at about 7%. If you don't prune your trees, it gets to 12, 13, even higher percent. So there's always a tendency to try and uh, keep it as small as possible. But as you'll see later on, it plays a very important uh, ecological role um, in the flow of energy uh, through the particular system. There's an overview of it at uh, eight years. At 11 years, you can see the third dimension developing nicely, 13 years. And <coughs> this is at 20 years. You can see the corn plants here. As Naresh mentioned, C4 plant doesn't take light well, so that's why you get that parabolic response. And in the foreground here, we have uh, willow planted at about 25 stems per hectare. So uh, unlike the previous talks, we were using willow as the uh, tree crop. We're actually using willow as the alley crop. And we've done that for several of our, our, of our alleys, and we've been at it for about uh, seven or eight years. And I'll come back to that uh, in a minute, because as it turns out, willow plays a very important role um, in terms of providing diversity for birds. So there's an overview of it. It looks really nice. And Rash and I were trying to figure out what time of the year that photo was taken. It must have been in, in June sometime. If you like that, if you'd like to come to visit, please do. We'll give you a tour, but you better do it within the next four years because it's all going to be concrete office buildings and residences, and it can't be stopped. There's nothing that can be done about it. So uh, the positive side is that it's generated something like 32 or 33 masters and PhDs uh, so far. So in 1995, um, we monitored uh, tree-based intercropping sites, an old field, and a monocrop uh, corn. I won't go into the various uh, techniques. Suffice to say that they were uh, suitable for the for the time period. 2014, we did the same thing: tree-based intercropping, an old field site, monocropped soybean. So the monocropped cornfield that we monitored in 1995 had disappeared, and all we could find relatively close was a monocropped soybean. That turned out to be a little uh, problematic. Uh, we also added a short rotation willow in an old growth um, hardwood forest. Oops. There we go. And there's some shots of uh, the different land uses. So there's your monocropped soybean. Note all the wood hedgerows and woodlots around it, which 
again, turned out to be problematic. Uh, the old field site, the tree-based intercropping site, the willow production site, and the old growth uh, hardwood forest, which is what much of southern Ontario would have looked like a long time ago. Used some very simple uh, statistical measures of uh, diversity, including the Shannon Winer. I won't actually talk about that today. And this one, the conservation uh, value index, we tend to place uh, social values on birds. Um, so we value certain types of birds more than others. And this index uh, takes into account uh, a species abundance, but it's also got a weighting factor, which is developed for each species around the world by the Partners in Flight, which is an international um, NGO, and that takes some of the bias uh, out of that. And I'll talk a little bit about more of that later. Um, we were a little worried about the differences in methodologies, 1995 to 2014. So we had, for example, square plots in 95 and circular plots in 2014. They're different sizes, they are different proximities. So we went to the ornithologists and asked them, and basically they found out that the time spent surveying each unit area was more or less <clears throat> the same. And as a result, we could make comparisons between the, the two systems. Uh, so the results <coughs> from 1995, eight years after inception, the breeding birds <coughs> were found to be greatest, oops, sorry, greatest in the, uh, the old field system, uh, then the intercrop, then of course the monocrop. Foraging birds though actually preferred the intercrop system comparable to, compared to the, to the old field. And the actual provision of nesting boxes in the intercrop field, like you see here, actually allowed certain populations of bird to actually take up residence in the intercrop field. So we got uh, bluebirds and tree swallows. This photo was taken on uh, May 22nd, 1994. May 23rd, 1994, I came out and there was just a pile of blue feathers on top of the bird box. So some raptor went away with a very full stomach that particular day. But that is life. And uh, if you're interested, <coughs> If you're interested in the full results of that study, it was actually published in the, the fourth North American uh, proceedings and presented in, in Boise and all the species lists are there as well. And we're actually going to be submitting this comparative paper to the special issues uh, for agroforestry systems. So just some uh, quick comparisons here. Here's uh, species diversity, 95 to 2014. Here's the intercrop, 17 species, almost doubled here to 32, but so did the old field. So the old field was changing as well. And here's the problematic monocrop. So this was monocrop corn, and that number should be more or less the same over there. But because of all the hedgerows and there were some building structures close to the soybean, it actually enhanced the populations. It's also interesting to note that the intercrop field had a higher number of bird species uh, than the actual old growth forest. And this is because the intercrop field has spaces for raptors and other birds to fly up and down and other places where birds can uh, rest and, and roost. So a total number of species differences across all of those land uses is substantially higher in uh, 2014. Here's the willow system that I was uh, talking about. Um, we've been at this now for almost uh, a decade. Our yields are approaching anywhere from 10 to 12 tons per hectare per year. We use it as the intercrop, not in all of our alleys, but in, in some of them. And just anecdotal information, as you walk through the willow, you see all sorts of insects in various stages of their life cycle in there. That provides food for birds, and we found lots of incidents of nests that occur in the, in the willow. And so uh, uh, that's quite important. So a tree-based intercropping system using willow as an intercrop is going to be a great place to grow birds. But even if you didn't want to use those alleys for willow, if you had a short rotation uh, willow plantation beside your TBI system, uh, that would be a good thing as, as well. Species richness, I've already presented a bit of this data here. So here's the difference in the TBI from 2014 to 95. The old field here, the problematic monocrop. I'd like to just chop that off right about right about there and again the difference between the TBI system and the old growth uh, forest so the reason this occurred is the species diversity was enhanced in 2000 or higher in 2014 largely because the system is aged so there's old pieces of dead wood which is provided habitat and food for woodpeckers for example and that third dimension is very nicely uh, developed so it provides nice roosts for for rafters uh, again the old field site has also aged 19 years and so it's providing good habitat for things like chestnut sided warbler and house wren and again the monocropped problematic uh, soy so there's a shot of a red-tailed hawk uh, sitting up in the uh, top of a tree there this is the leave area that I was 
uh, telling you about. It's probably about 11% of our total field area right now. And we used to whippersnip it because we were concerned that the weed species from the, from the uh, leave row would actually end up in the, in the crop alleys. Uh, we had a student, uh, master student, uh, Eugene Cote, who dispelled that myth. So we stopped whippersnipping it and the weeds are just totally abundant there now. And if you go there, you can actually hear moles, mice, and voles, other rodents, rabbits running up and down uh, those leaf strips, and that's exactly what that guy is waiting for right there. So by intercropping, you've actually changed the entire way of how energy flows uh, through the system. So I mentioned the conservation value of a bird community. You've got to make a, a value judgment. And so, for example, we uh, appreciate species at risk more than ones that are not at risk. We appreciate native species more than we do non-native species. And the use of that uh, conservation value index just takes that uh, bias away, basically. And so here's some conservation value data. The first thing you should note is that in 2014, because there's really not much difference between any of the land use systems in terms of their ability to provide habitat for different suites of birds. Again, that monocrop one in 2014, I'm convinced, should be lower. But what's more interesting is that the 2014 values were all below what they were in 1995. And this was a little bit stymieing at first. And basically what we've put this down to is that previously abundant species are now in decline. So whereas that old field supported things like bobolink, that's now supporting mid-successional habitat. It's no longer available to bobolinks, and the bobolink has, has moved on and taken its conservation value um, with it, basically. So here are the species found in the intercrop field in 1995 and then in 2014. Here are the ones that are unique to uh, 1995 that we have no longer found. So again, for whatever reason, they've moved on, Canada goose there. And then here <coughs> we have species that are new in 2014. So those ones that have, have disappeared have been replaced by an entire new suite of, of species of birds that are now using the uh, intercrop site. So, what can we conclude from all this? I think, as I said initially, I could have given this talk in two or three slides, adding a third dimension. If you're interested in bird species, it's just common sense. You're going to increase habitat for, for insects. We've shown that at, the, at our research site, and, and that's going to lead to increased avian presence. The bigger scale, which is not really a conclusion but a suggestion, but that intercropping at latitudes that uh, coincide where the breeding ranges of certain songbirds are would be a great land use system that actually could help uh, stave off the slow decline of these songbirds. Um, it's, you get back into the age old questions, how do you get farmers to adopt intercropping systems. They're not adopting it for money, they're not adopting it for carbon, they're not adopting it for water quality, so they're certainly not going to adopt it for songbirds. But I think carbon is going to push them over the edge because you can't become carbon neutral if you're driving a John Deere up and down the field blowing diesel out the stack. <clears throat> You've got to have a tree in your system. You could even go so far as to modify the tree architecture. So if you knew a particular songbird that had particular habitat requirements, you could plant an intercrop field and either prune those trees or grow them in such a way that they provided that actual habitat. Classic examples in forestry. The forestry profession by itself saved the Kirtland's warbler, and they simply did that by providing vast expanses of 15-year-old jack pine trees all over Michigan. And that bird went from being endangered to very sustainable right now. So it is, it is indeed possible, but we need the farm community on hand in order to help us get there. And as I was researching this, trying to um, give myself a little bit of knowledge on birds. I came across this, ironically, uh, from the Ontario Agricultural College uh, Review. Saunders, writing in 1909, advised the farmer set aside a prepared shrubbery for the breeding birds and create cavities for nesting so you can take full advantage of all the benefits that bird populations would actually bring uh, to agricultural systems in terms of their ability to prey on insects and keep pest populations down. So I think I went over a little bit, but I know in the last uh, talk of the entire conference, so uh, I'd be happy to answer any, any questions that you might have. Have, have you or any, anyone you know have looked at 
how uh, different bird species with different habitat preferences are affected differentially by these by these um, different practices. I'm thinking about like forest interior <coughs> aggregate birds, and they may not benefit as much. Right. Obviously, no, we haven't haven't looked at that. Um, what I can tell you, I think that it's a it's a mix on on the landscape. I. I think I, I can safely say that tree-based intercropping bird diversity increases as, as it ages. Um, what suite of birds that you're going to end up with is going to depend on how close your TBI system is to a chunk of old growth forest, is to a chunk of some other uh, um, evolving forest basically or old field forest or, or something like that. So I think it's at the landscape scale and actually I was talking to Sophie ab about this. Uh, you could actually uh, go one scale up and look at, at uh, beta and gamma diversity but and then you'd start to get into some of those questions right there but it would be a difficult study to, to undertake. Sorry, could you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Is, are there other um, like management issues within the intercropping system that affect birds, like pruning or? Um, uh, I think most of the deleterious ones um, we've gotten out of our system. We don't have any control on the cropping practices, so there are chemicals uh, utilized basically um, in the alleys for certain crops, specific to certain crops. Uh, they don't appear to be affecting the increase in the number of bird species, but they may be affecting uh, the diversity of, of, of the birds or which actual species are, are utilizing the site. Um, we don't really have any negative practices in terms of um, uh, cutting grass or any, anything like that. So, um, and I think that you wouldn't get bobblings in this system simply because there's not not enough expanse of, of leave area. Is there a general, not a guide, but information, printed information on bird nesting in fields? up and down the United States, Canada, and Mexico on nesting of all birds so somebody could say, geez, I don't cut it this time of the year. It's, you know, it's practices in their, in their management of their system. You know, just as I started to go through the ornithological literature to bring myself up to speed, you could fill this room with books probably on that topic dating back to 1857 and as recent as 2014. So there's a lot of information out there. The birding, the birding component of the U.S. and the Canadian population is huge. It is a huge, huge industry and authors have responded to that and are, are producing information like, like crazy. But a lot of that information on nesting, I know it exists. I can't give you a specific reference, well, you know, but I know it's there. We're, I'm in, you know, in Texas. Well, I'll tell you what, you overgraze, there's no birds. And as soon as the grass comes back, birds come back. Right. So it must be due to nesting something. Right. Food, you know. Interesting. That's good, Todd. All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.